So good evening and welcome to this broadcast of a snapshot of the management of acute appendicitis in the UK during COVID. Um, we have three other panellists this evening. Um, we're going to talk about acute appendicitis and what's been happening recently, both in the adult and the paediatric population. And we're also going to mention two major observational studies which have happened during this time, the Cascade study and the COVID harm study. Next slide, please, Vix. Yeah. It's glitched already. We've been on yeah. two seconds. <laughs> Aha. So my name's Jill Tierney. Um, I'm a colorectal surgeon and I'm based in Derby. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, I am the ASGBI Director of Emergency General Surgery. Thanks. So the Association of Surgeons of Great Britain and Ireland is in its hundredth year, and what a year so far. Um, despite being one of the oldest or the oldest professional association in surgery, we have, along with our sister associations, embraced technology, um, and we've adapted our usual meetings and educational sessions to be held in this virtual manner. So welcome to tonight's webinar, which is our first of a regular series, we hope. Uh, we think we're being attended, it's really difficult when we can't see you, but we believe we're being attended by almost 200 delegates. Um, and we'll put details of the further ASGBI webinars out on the ASGBI website subsequently. Um, I hope that this evening demonstrates what a vibrant and inclusive surgical association the ASGBI is. Um, we have interest in the generality of surgery and so by default in emergency surgery. Um, we're going to start this evening with the results of a Twitter poll, which we've put out for the last 48 hours. So if we could have those, please, Vix. And we asked two specific questions. Biggie. We will see the results of the Twitter poll in a minute. Um, we asked basically what people's practice in appendicitis was like at the moment and what would make them change, if anything. And there is a slide with the results because I've seen it. And here it is. So the two questions we asked were the first one was, how did your management of acute appendicitis change during COVID? And that's fairly evenly distributed. Roughly a third said it didn't change at all. A third again said they did their lap appendixes open. And about 40% said they changed to purely conservative treatment with antibiotics. The second question we asked was, after COVID, are you going to keep changing your practice? And are you going to manage appendicitis conservatively? And what reasons would stop you doing that? And you'll see the results there. That the majority of people were worried that the appendicitis would come back if they didn't remove the appendix. A few people worried about a lack of evidence um, and just a few who were going to go for it, 15%, and change their practice. So we'll move on to the first of our speakers this evening. Um, just to say at the end of their talks, when you'll have been fully educated, entertained and informed, and I'm going for entertainment most with this first speaker, um, we're going to do another live Twitter poll that you can do on the screen during the presentation and we'll see if your answers have changed. So our first speaker is Professor Susan Moog, who is a colorectal surgeon at the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Paisley. She's an honorary professor of the University of Glasgow. She has a senior fellowship from the Chief Scientist's Office and she is joint subspecialty lead for colorectal surgery at the Royal College of Surgeons of England. And she's also an ASGBI regional representative. Over to you, Susan. Thanks, Joe. Uh, first slide, please. So I know this is what you've all tuned in for. It's the guidelines. It's not anything to do with the really exciting research projects that are coming after this. So a few slides on the background of where we think the current practice is with acute appendicitis. So it's the commonest surgical emergency in the world. There's an 8% lifetime risk for Europeans, with the peak age, as we know, in the younger group, 10 to 30 years. So what does that equate to? Well, it thinks it's about 30,000 appendicectomies are performed in the UK, or England actually, and that goes up to 300,000 in the USA per year. So this is not a small volume um, disease. Reassuringly, mortality is pretty low. 
and we know it's lower if the patient presents with a non-gangrenous, non-perforated appendix. Perforation, the thing that we're all worried about, occurs in about 40% of patients, but that's a varied percentage through the literature. And the extremes of age, so young and old, carry the higher perforation risk, and more so in the older population. Next slide, please. For years now, appendicectomy is accepted as the primary treatment, and that's in both adults and paediatric populations. And when, then when the laparoscopic approach became um, more favoured, that's now the number one recommendation. So wound infections are reduced with lap approach, post-operative morbidity is reduced, length of stay is shorter, and quality of life scores are reported as being better. As I say, that's for both adults and paediatrics. And I think the initial concern about laparoscopic appendicectomy related around pelvic collections with the washout, but I suspect that's been a bit of the learning curve. And now, as we see, the morbidity is lower with a laparoscopic approach. Next slide, please. So patients have great outcomes, and from a training perspective, it's one of the few bits of surgery that you, you, know, you really get stuck in. Your consultant, if they're there, is on the camera, so they can't interfere with your two-hand ports doing some stuff. And it's just really good to start to get your lab skills up. So good outcomes, good for trainees. There's no issue why we're on this webinar. Next slide, please. Well, I think there's two issues. One is, are we not doing enough diagnostic CTs? And as a result of that, is the 20% negative appendicectomy rate, so NER, is that acceptable in the modern surgical era? And prognostic scores that we use commonly in the UK, and there's been recent publications on that, are they a poorer option to CT and we're compensating? And then what about actually over-operating? As surgeons, we love to operate, we don't like to say we're not, but we are worried about perforation and we know it carries the poorest outcomes. But perforation is not inevitable just in all acute appendicitis presentations. And where then does non-operative management come in? Next slide. So conveniently for this webinar, there was a nice update on the Jerusalem guidelines just published just before lockdown. Thank you very much. So this is the World Society of Emergency Surgery. They did the first guidelines, if you haven't read them, in 2015, 2016, and then they updated them with a fairly prolonged and intense process, grading the recommendations to bring this to you. Next slide. So what did they comment on? Well, first of all, if we go back to our issues, are we not doing enough diagnostic CTs? Well, they did state there's significant geographical variation in diagnostic approach. CTs are very common in the USA and Europe, as we probably know. In the UK, we tend to favor a clinical approach, but also use ultrasound, mainly to exclude pelvic pathology. And we also like a bit of a prognostic score. Surgeons love a prognostic score. But as a result, we think this is probably where the negative appendicectomy rate varies. So the USA has been documented as lower rate as 4.5%, and that was after certain studies showing that CT reduced that significantly. In Europe, they've got as low as 2.6% in men, higher in women, but still only 10%. And then compare that to the UK figure that I gave you earlier, that goes up to 282 in women, and that's from the RIF study. Next slide. So what do the Jerusalem guidelines recommend? Well, they say routine clinical and radiological imaging to improve diagnosis. So that's the adult and the paediatric population. And again, in both those populations, they favor ultrasound as the first imaging, but do put the cover on it saying that you have to have a sonographer that's experienced in that, not only with pelvic pathology, but also at looking for an appendicitis um, vision. If you have a strong clinical suspicion though, you've got high risk on your scores and your patient is under 40 years, then there's no indication for a CT. You should probably go straight to surgery at that point. And I guess that's your classic young boy, comes in, thin, classic story, right-sided iliac fossa pain moving from the central side, you should go straight to surgery. Then you get into a more interesting area. They then suggest that if your ultrasound doesn't give you any help, then you should do a CT, particularly where you've got a low suspicion of acute appendicitis and there's no clinical improvement. If your CT then doesn't give you the answer, then you move into the area of the diagnostic lap. So there's a kind of a three-tier system for adults there. They also then advocate that a CT should be contrast enhanced and you should have a consideration for a lower radiation dose, which they think will be sensitive and specific enough to diagnose acute appendicitis. For paediatrics, they say there's no evidence for a CT in that kind of setting, as they think the ultrasound is pretty good predictor. I'm sure Nigel will have a comment on that. Next slide, please. And then what about the over-operating issue? Well, there is fairly good evidence that antibiotics first or the non-operative approach is safe and effective in selected patients. And I'll discuss selected in a second. But your recurrence risk is 27.3%. And that goes up from one year up to 39% of five years. What's not clear to me is though, is whether that's recurrent appendicitis in all these patients 
or whether some people are just getting a little bit twitchy and feel that it needs to come out, whether that's due to a higher age, you know, over 40s, over 50s with the malignancy risk, it's a bit uncertain, but certainly it does creep up as you go from one to five years. There's other concerns that if you have recurrence or you do take the appendix out, then that'll be a more difficult, you know, more prolonged recovery for the patient. And actually the inverse seems to be true. So it's almost like a delayed uh, cholecystectomy kind of approach. You know, if you treat the acute cholecystitis and you wait six weeks, that's an acceptable approach, depends on your feelings, obviously. But is that something we should be considering with the appendix if we're going to do that? Because certainly if they've got a better recovery, the costs are lower as a result. Next slide. And what do we mean by selected? Well, most of the RCTs and most of the meta-analyses look at uncomplicated appendicitis. So we're not really sure about perforation. Is that something you can manage conservatively? Is that just out the window? And what do we mean by uncomplicated? Is that just a bit of periappendiceal fluid? But there does seem to be a fairly good risk factor that if you have an appendolith, both in paediatric and adult population, that is not only associated with the perforation risk, but it also associated with the failure of conservative management. But again, there needs to be imaging to get that. And the last group that we don't know very much about is pregnant patients. I guess our default is we have a bit of surgery that works. We should probably take out the appendix because it's too risky in pregnant patients. And as a result, there's no evidence of any conservative intervention. Last slide, please. So in summary, acute appendicitis is very common. We all know that. We all know it's first line um, for treatment to get uh, the appendix out and ideally laparoscopic approach. What we don't know is that the routine use of low dose CT would that reduce our negative appendicectomy rate and allow patients options for non-operative management. I can't think of any other bit of surgery that we do that you would have a shared decision with the patient where you say there's a 20% chance that this might not be the right operation. And that's me. Thank you very much. So we're going to take questions from the now 120 participants um, at the end of the three talks. So we now move on to Hannah Javanmard. Um, Hannah is a surgical trainee in the East Midlands. She's currently out of program studying for a PhD. Um, Hannah is the National NILA Surgical Research Fellow. Um, and Hannah's done a ton of work. Over to you, Hannah. Hi everyone. Um, first slide please, Vicky. Um, so as uh, Ms. Tierney said, I am a research fellow and I am on the steering committee for the COVID harem, had appendicitis and resolved slash recurred emergency morbidity and mortality study. Um, so as Ms. Moogas has alluded to, appendicitis is really common. Uh, there's an 8.6% risk lifetime in males and 67 in females. And in the UK, our first line management for this is an early appendicectomy, and we do this a lot. So last year in England, we did 30,000 appendicectomies. And the RIFT study has shown that predominantly we do them laparoscopically. So 98% uh, were done laparoscopically in females, and 94% were done laparoscopically in males. Next slide, please, Vicky. But there is a body of evidence that suggests that non-operative management, so with antibiotics, is effective and can be safe. There's numerous meta-analyses and many randomised clinical trials in Europe, but this has failed really to get traction in the UK. Next slide, Vicky. Until COVID happened and everything changed really. So these guidelines were intercollegiate general surgery guidelines released um, towards the end of March and they suggested that we should really be uh, avoiding laparoscopy where all possible, managing appendicitis conservatively and if that fails um, doing open operations and these in part recommendations were due to the risks that the COVID surge collaborative had found with 25% mortality in COVID positive surgical patients whether they were having minor or major procedures and also because there were concerns that uh, laparoscopy, the smoke plume from diathermy and intubation all carried a risk, uh, risk of creating aerosols which contained COVID-19. So we had a massive shift in a really short period of time with how we fundamentally manage these patients and the idea was to capture what exactly is happening to these patients and what their outcomes are. Next slide please Vicky. So we formulated covid harem which was a multi-center observational cohort study looking at all adults with symptoms of appendicitis presenting in the UK after lockdown. 
and this was whether they were diagnosed radiologically or clinically and whether they were managed with antibiotics or operation with a plan to follow them up at 30 days for complications and at 90 days for recurrence. Next slide please Vicky. And we did this really fast. So our steering committee formed uh, this formed of trainees and consultants from up and down the country. Within four days, we had a protocol and a data collection performer written. And within 10 days, we had our first patient on REDCap. So it really shows you what you can do if you really put your mind to it. And also when uh, some of the bureaucracy gets out of the way. Next slide, please, Vicky. And we've really made excellent progress so far. So we have 82 sites registered across the UK and also in the Republic of Ireland. We've got another 30 sites just pending their local registration. And as of today, we've got 1,250 patients enrolled. We've had our protocol published in the BJS. We're going to be featured on a European Society of Colour Proctology podcast. And this week we've submitted our interim analysis paper looking at the first 500 patients with 30 day follow up with a plan to have a definitive paper ready in the next month. Next slide, please, Vicky. And today we wanted to talk about some of our key results. So we recruited 500 patients from 48 sites. Of these patients, 46% were planned for operation from the first day and 54% were conservatively managed. Of this operative group, you can see that more than half were managed with an open appendectomy, which is a massive shift if you can remember our numbers from the RIFT slide. Um, of the conservatively managed patients, 90% got away without an operation and only 10% required an operation at 30 days. The important thing to know is that there was no difference in age, comorbidities or frailty score between these two groups. And when it came to outcomes, the conservatively managed group had fewer complications and a significantly shorter length of hospital stay. In our series, we found 10 patients with COVID. Uh, six were diagnosed on admission swabs and four were diagnosed later on in admission. A really interesting part was only 32% of our 500 patients got a COVID swab at all in hospital. And the conservatively managed group were much less likely to have a COVID swab than the operative managed group. Next slide, please, Vicky. We thought we'd look at the conservative group in more detail. So this is a flow chart of our study patients. And you can just see highlighted in the red ring are the conservatively managed patients. So this is 271 of 500, of which eight had an IR drain and 26 had an operation, which means that 88% of our appendicitis patients were treated with antibiotics alone and nothing else. Next slide, please, Vicky. We also wanted to know what was happening as the situation was evolving. Obviously, the pandemic is a really dynamic situation. Guidelines came and went as, it, as the situation progressed. So we looked week on week at the changes that were in the management style. So this graph shows stacked the percentage of patients each week that were managed either conservatively, laparoscopically, or with an open procedure. Now the important bits here, you can see the very first bar, the one with a star, this is the week that those blue guidelines came out suggesting that we try and manage patients conservatively. And at this point, 50% of patients that week were managed with antibiotics. And you can see there's a very small percent, just the small red bar that were treated laparoscopically. Then in week five, where the lightning bolt is, the ALS GBI released guidelines about how to safely do laparoscopic surgery. And you can see that the percentage of laparoscopically managed patients suddenly really jumps. So we've got a lot of work left to do. Next slide, please, Vicky. But in conclusion, we have shown that COVID-19 has markedly disrupted how we manage appendicitis in the UK, with conservative management really being favoured. In this setting, non-operative management of appendicitis appears to be effective first-line treatment, regardless of age or comorbidity, with only a minority requiring surgery as second-line treatment. We've got a lot of work left to do, 
we want to say a massive thank you to all of our contributors who have made a Herculean effort to get all of these patients uploaded. But it's not over yet. It's not too late to take part. You can download the protocol from the Royal College of Surgeons website and email your registrations to us at covidharem at asgbi.org.uk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> and so we're going to move on next to our final speaker, who is Nigel Hall. Um, Nigel is an Associate Professor of Paediatric Surgery at the University of Southampton. And Nigel is the Royal College of Surgeons of England Specialty Lead for Collaborative Research in Paediatric Surgery. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Jill, and uh, thank you very much for considering including children in this webinar tonight because I think they're a population that often get missed, but as I'm sure many people on this webinar um, are all too acutely aware, the majority of children with appendicitis in the UK are treated not in specialist children's hospitals, but in district general hospitals by general surgeons. Uh, first slide, please, Vicky. So much of what I'm going to talk about will be very uh, familiar and might sound a bit repetitive, for which I apologise. Hannah and I actually spoke at a similar event last week and I had the privilege of going first, so now she's stolen most of my thunder this week. Uh, next slide, please. So, so just a quick uh, recap um, for the situation with children in the UK. Um, it's the most common cause of um, abdominal surgery in children with over 8,000 cases per year. And just as in adults pre-COVID, almost all cases were treated with an appendicectomy, so surgically. And slightly uh, lower use of laparoscopy in children than in adults, but up between 70 and 80% overall done laparoscopically in children. Next slide, please. This is all now history to us and we're all too familiar with it. Um, but the point being that not only did our elective surgery um, disappear pretty much overnight, but our attitudes towards emergency surgery did as well. Next slide, please. And just as Hannah um, outlined the risks of laparoscopy and the risks of taking uh, patients to theatre at all were emphasised, um, and, and it wasn't really clear whether these should be applied to children or not, um, but we suspected that they would be, um, because there was a lot of concern about operating on positive patients in particular. Next slide, please. So we were left um, considering how should we treat appendicitis and perhaps also just what I emphasize is considering why we should do that and perhaps trying to understand whose benefit these changes were being made. And a concern that um, we particularly had was what the impact of these changes in practice would be on patient outcomes. Next slide, please. So we set up this uh, study that we've called Cascade, and apologies for the um, mnemonic. Uh, next slide, please. And the aims really of this were to understand the impact um, of what was going on, how, on how children with appendicitis were treated. And as I say, also to focus on the relationship between these changes and patient outcomes. Next slide, please. And um, the way we did this was, as, as well as doing an observational cohort study, much like the COVID harem study, we also um, have embedded within that some surveys um, about UK practice. And the first survey we did was right at the beginning of the pandemic, where we asked both specialist paediatric and general surgeons from a range of centres um, whether they had already experienced a change in the way they treated children with appendicitis and whether they anticipated making a change over the coming months. Looking back, I'd be interested to go back to the 10% who anticipated no change and seeing what they've actually managed to do. But the key findings are here are that most um, anticipated using non-operative treatment, um, which was almost unheard of in children um, before COVID came along. About 50% planned to use open as opposed to laparoscopic surgery. There were other recommended um, changes in terms of shorter hospital stay, shorter courses of intravenous antibiotics, generally less invasive treatments. A suggestion that surgeons would be more inclined to use imaging to be more certain of the diagnosis before making treatment decisions and greater consultant involvement in decision making as well. Next slide, please. So we started our data collection on the 1st of April 
Uh, and so far we've got, this is now up to 77 centres, which includes all 26 specialist children's hospitals in the UK, um, and now over 50 uh, general hospitals. And it's not too late to register to take part. Um, please um, find the details on, on Twitter using our Twitter handle there. Next slide, please. So I just thought I'd share with you the analysis that we've done to date, which relates to the cohort of children with appendicitis treated during April of this year. Um, data has been received from 51 of those sites thus far and um, just over 300 children. So the first shift um, is, is obvious in the bottom line of that, that 130, so about just under 45% have been treated initially with antibiotics. So as per the adult data, a huge shift in practice from almost exclusive use of surgery to nearly half of all children being, being treated with antibiotics. And then again, a huge shift in practice from predominantly laparoscopic surgery in children to under half of all children now having a laparoscopic procedure during April of this year. We've had a, 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 some insight into the outcomes of um, antibiotics alone for appendicitis in this group of children, and 75%, um, so slightly lower than in the adult population, um, have responded successfully to non-operative treatment to being discharged home. Uh, and just two of those children um, in this cohort tested positive for coronavirus. Next slide, please. Um, we've had a chance to do a little more analysis on these data. So we've noticed a much higher use of any sort of diagnostic imaging in children than in pre-COVID times. So data from previous national studies of appendicitis in children suggests that between about 30 and 40% have some sort of diagnostic imaging. So we're now over half of all these children. Um, and in children, the majority of this is ultrasound. So only six of these children had a CT scan. Whether it's also related to that, but just 4% had a negative appendicectomy. And the national figure for that is around 11, 12% overall. Um, as per the adult data, higher in some of those groups, particularly adolescent girls, but 4% negative appendicectomy for the UK is about the lowest figure ever published. We've seen a 14% um, incidence of any complications following surgery, and that's roughly equal for both laparoscopic and open procedures. And clearly further analysis and data collection is pending. Next slide, please. So we're gonna to continue to collect data for this study essentially until more normal delivery of emergent surgery resumes. We, we have a program where we are trying to feed back these data to sites regularly, really so that we can have some sort of monitoring and reporting on outcomes. So if there are patterns that come out along the way, we feel it's important that um, surgeons are able to have availability to have those data early and consider changing their practice to maximize their patient outcomes from this. And also we're keen to maximize the opportunity to learn as much as we can from this, particularly about non-operative treatment in case we want to consider using this in the future. Next slide, please. So as I say, thank you very much for uh, involving children in this. Um, do please um, visit us on Twitter where you can find information about how to join the study if you've not already signed up. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. So we're now going to relaunch the poll. So at the bottom of your screen, there was an option that said poll that I can't see now. Oh, there it goes. So um, there's an option to fill in. Once you filled that in, if you can see that on your screens, it will disappear. If you can't see it on your screen, along the bottom space bar, there is a polling button to press and you will see the poll and get rid of it. Um, we'll announce the results a bit later on. But we have a few questions. There are 130 of you out there. So we have, um, if you wish to ask a question, on your bottom space bar, there is a button marked Q&A. Um, not everybody's that bright. So some participants, Mr. Richard Guy, have pressed the wrong button, but have asked a very interesting question. So we'll allow you to um, ask your question, which was um, Richard's question, perhaps to Susan, was so once you've done this and successfully treated somebody conservatively with antibiotics 
who should go on to have an appendicectomy? That's an easy part of the question. Who should go on to have a colonoscopy? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, the guidelines actually, they comment on that because I know there's the um, twitchiness about are you missing malignancy in the older adults with appendicitis and what is the older adult? I mean, to me, that's people over, um, I don't know, Jill, how, how, how old are you, Jill? Sorry. Oh, anyway, moving on, moving on. So anyway, the, the Jerusalem guidelines say if you're less than 40, there's no indication for an interval appendicectomy um, or no strong, we grade it all, obviously, so there's no strong indication you should have an interval appendicectomy. If you're um, just slightly older and just over 40, um, then what you should do is consider maybe a follow-up colonoscopy in these patients, and if they've not had a CT, do a CT. Um, again, it's not really high-level evidence, but that might cover you for the unexpected malignancy. And that's their guidelines. So I'd probably be having a colonoscopy then. Thanks for that, Susan. Um, we have some other questions. Christian Mikucevic, I might address this one to Hannah, says, if we still have this very high normal appendicectomy rate, should we be adopting more CT scanning? Well, so the interesting bit of this study is that during the pandemic, we have. So at, from our data, 85% of appendicitis patients are getting some form of imaging, and 71% of that is a CT scan. Um, the RIFT study showed that 40% of their patients weren't getting any imaging, and 60% were getting imaging, predominantly ultrasound. So we have moved during this crisis to CT scanning. There is evidence out there that we should maybe be considering low-dose CT scanning um, for these appendicitis patients. Okay, Nigel, what about in the paediatric population? It seems a no-brainer in the adults. What's your feeling about imaging in peds? In children, there is no doubt that uh, centers who, you, who use imaging more routinely, and particularly in North America and Europe, have much lower uh, negative appendicectomy rates. And as Hannah mentioned, in, in similar to the findings related to adults, um, in the RIF study, which is I think the most recent national data that, it, that is available to us, about 40% of children in the UK had any sort of diagnostic imaging. And that's by far and away um, ultrasound. Um, just a couple of uh, children, even in that large study, had a CT scan. Um, the, the, the problems, of course, with implementing ultrasound um, for this are around uh, user dependency of ultrasound and availability of ultrasound for children for emergency admissions. Um, and, and so a lot of the challenges around implementing that in the UK are logistic as much as anything else. But there's certainly an association between increasing use of ultrasound and lower negative appendicectomy rate. And it may be that we've seen some of that in this study so far already. So more children thus far in, in the pandemic have had an ultrasound scan. And as I say, the negative appendicectomy rate is about the lowest it's ever been reported in the UK. Okay. Um, I, I guess it's that friends and family test, isn't it? I would probably want a CT if I came in with query appendicitis. Absolutely. It feels like we should be doing it, doesn't it? And we've got a question from um, Malalil Matthew, probably to Hannah, sorry, to ask, what's your post-op complication rate in the patients who had surgery in the study? Um, so I don't have a complication rate of itself. Um, overall complications were fairly low. So in the operative group, um, we had uh, 27 um, abdominal collections, uh, seven reoperations, and six patients um, had an unplanned stay in the high dependency or intensive care unit. And Nigel, what about in the paediatric population, the operated group? <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Um, our, our complication rate is 14%. It's a relatively small data set. Um, we haven't yet analysed the detail of those complications, but it's about equal for both open and laparoscopic cases. Okay. So lots of questions coming in. Cleo Kennington, who's one of our ASGBI regional reps, has asked, quite rightly said, COVID surge reported a mortality of 24% for patients undergoing surgery. Um, what was the outcome for the positive, COVID positive patients in COVID harem who had an operation? How did they do? 
Okay, that's good. Um, so really interestingly, actually, um, we had no mortality at all. Um, it might reflect the young population that comes in with appendicitis. In the COVID surge data, they had much lower mortality. Um, five of these patients were operated on and five weren't. Um, one developed appendicitis related complications and one had a DVT or PE. Difficult to tell whether that's directly related to COVID. So we have another, I'm not sure if it's a question or a statement from Simon Patterson Brown. I'm going to read it and then we'll discuss it, I think. So um, I might put this to Susan. Um, so Simon quite rightly says that the problem here is that the evidence for non-operative treatment of acute appendicitis seems to relate to the simple, easy peasy, uncomplicated appendix cases. So obviously you'll get away with that, but he feels that anything other than simple cases should be offered a lap appendix, not an open appendix, and he's written this is a very retrograde step with an exclamation mark. Discuss Professor Moog. <laughs> Thanks. Um, good question, but I think um, so Hannah's data from this study is 30 day follow-up. We're expecting 90 days and we've obviously had conversations about trying to extend that to pick up people's concerns in the long term. But what Hannah's data has is all comers. So yeah, he's quite right. All the stuff from before is very selected patients. It's a very tight group. There's concerns about including, not necessarily just perforated appendicitis, but the guys in between that may be scoring really high in the severity scores. So I think as Hannah's data begins to mature, you will actually get a real life, live, true to form study about what actually you can do with conservative management. In a, in a population where you're not selecting, so there's no selection bias. And I suspect Nigel will get the same sort of answers as well. And that's a big, big step forward compared to all the other studies before where they're tentatively trying to explore the conservative management. So, you know, early days yet, but we need to see what the, the true data shows as it begins to mature. So another interesting point from an anonymous attendee, um, it's an unusual name, isn't it? Who says that in light of um, Mike Kelly and Ronan Cahill's publication in colorectal disease, um, we should put a qualitative aspect to the COVID harm data. And that's actually a very good point uh, because their paper suggested that lots of conservatively managed patients complained about high rates of ongoing pain and two thirds of them in that study would opt for an upfront appendicectomy if they were given the choice again. Um, I suppose it's different in a paediatric population. What are your thoughts about that, Nigel? Parents, I guess, would be the ones. Yeah, so we've done some qualitative work with parents about their views on non-operative treatment. And, and you're right, it, I think it is, it does add a different aspect to this because um, it, it's all very well operating on the patient and the patient's deciding, but very few parents actually want their child to have an operation when there's an alternative available that might be successful. Of course, what we don't quite know yet is how successful because the comparative data in children compared to appendicectomy for children with similar um, severity of disease just don't exist at the moment. Um, but we have, we, we have actually done a feasibility trial in the UK comparing those two treatments. And one of the things we did was some qualitative work in that. And that enabled us to a certain extent to look at um, how children who were treated non-operatively felt about it down the line, including those who didn't respond to treatment. And actually the majority of patients who had non-operative treatment um, were happy that they'd made the decision to have um, the non-operative approach, um, even if it hadn't been successful. Um, but, but I think the, the long-term data um, as, as, as been raised here does suggest that there may be some regrets down the line um, in adults, for sure. And I think I would say for the COVID harm study, certainly that was just observational. So we didn't have the ethics approval to intervene with the question. Um, so I'm conscious we've got, we've got a lot. This is good. It's lively. It's exciting. People are interested. So we'll have some from some um, exotic places. We have a lady called Elizabeth Dolores oof, Canton who says that she lives in Mexico and in her country, they don't have enough pediatric surgeons. So the general surgeons do the appendicectomies most of the time. And with the pandemic, um, in, do, they do a CT thorax and abdomen in adults and children. What are your thoughts about CT chest and abdomen in, in the pediatric population, Nigel? Um, I have real concerns about it. Um, for, uh, and, and it's all about the radiation risk. So there's a, there's, um, as I'm sure most of the people on the webinar are aware, there's, there's a real risk of um, secondary malignancies. It's been estimated as about 
one secondary malignancy for every 1,000 CT scans in children. Um, so it's a real concern. Um, and it, it's actually really quite difficult in the UK to get a CT scan. Um, certainly you'd never get one, I, I think, without really trying hard for a child who you felt the diagnosis with appendicitis. I'd agree with that. As, as far as the thorax goes, I think in children it's really unnecessary. Um, the, the thorax, of course, is all about screening for COVID-19. Um, and we know that children are not as severely affected as adults. So, so I really think it's not necessary as a screening test. Um, and I would strongly discourage it. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, an interesting question, and one that crossed my mind from Thomas Badenoch. Um, nobody's mentioned MRI. Professor Moog, thoughts about MRI in the assessment of acute appendicitis? It's not, not something that I would normally consider because it's usually harder to get an MRI, isn't it, than a, a CT. Um, I guess we do it in the pregnant query appendix, don't we? Often that's the only time I'd use it. Yeah, that's right, actually. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess you just want the answer. I guess your decision really is how are you going to get it? So if MRI is better, maybe radiation dose versus a CT, but then can you do a limited right elect fossa CT with a lower radiation dose? And I think someone's asked there whether it needs to be contrast enhanced. And it does look as if the suggestions say, yes, it should be contrast enhanced. But is a low-dose CT better or worse than an MRI? And depending on what facilities you have. I mean, I think MRI is used more in paediatrics, Nigel. Is that right? Yes, yeah, yeah. so Nigel, what about in PEDS? So what about ultrasound straight to MRI? So it, it, it is reported um, in places in the world that have better healthcare resources than we do here. Um, it, it, I, I think the logistics of it in the UK mean that it's just not going to be feasible to do that. But there is a literature that suggests that MRI can be useful for the diagnosis of appendicitis for certain. And maybe another modality in which we could safely reduce the negative appendicectomy rate. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so we're still bashing on here. We've got more a couple of statements, really. Um, Simon Patterson Brown from Edinburgh is saying that in Edinburgh, they just continue to offer their lap appendix throughout COVID. Um, didn't consider there was enough data. And I know that's a feeling that many units have had about many sorts of surgery, but he does say they use CT more prior to embarking on surgery. Um, so we have the next person that logically is an anonymous question, and I'll put it to all the panel. So to Nigel first, are you still being selective now in who you offer lap surgery to, or are you doing lap appendix back to normal? What are you doing? So we have gone back to doing laparoscopy for everyone here locally in Southampton. We did have a period I'd say it didn't last very long um, where we were um, doing some open surgery, but we've certainly been offering uh, conservative treatment more frequently. Well, okay. We're now back to laparoscopy. And Professor Moog? Uh, we're not quite there yet. I think we still get concerns over what's going on and we're still waiting on our kind of extractor to make everyone feel a bit happier about the virus not being spread around the theatres. Um, I suspect it'll change pretty quickly in the next one to two weeks. Okay, now Hannah, a different one for you. Do you believe that 90 days is long enough to say that antibiotics are safe to manage something conservatively with follow-up? Well, I mean, so this study had to be put together quickly in the scope of a changing field of a pandemic. Um, however, we would like and we're hoping to go further with this and look at these patients at a year and maybe more, but that's all further work down the line. Okay, um, a question about um, PPE. So just to all the panellists really, we'll start with Nigel again. Are you still continuing with full PPE for the appendicectomy in your population? Uh, sadly we are, yes. I, I, I say sadly because we're very much driven by the Public Health England guidance, which says that that's what we should be doing. Um, but we are trying to do a piece of work um, looking at to seeing if it would be safe to remove that for operating on children in particular. Okay, Professor Moog? Yeah, same, still full PPE. Um, and I don't think Hannah's data really is pulling out the COVID issue here. If you've got COVID surge, which is positive COVID swabs, I suspect because we're the first 30 days that a lot of the trusts weren't up and running with early swabbing of patients, or maybe our guys are not presenting with temperature to flag that up. So I don't think from the first month, six weeks worth of data, we can say, that there's a low instance of COVID in this population. I think it's just we're not swabbing. So PPE, I guess. Okay, I'm just conscious we've got lots of questions. Hannah, another study specific one for you. 
Um, do you have a feeling for the data on time to operation from diagnosis in, in the COVID harem study? Because Sarah Daniels is reporting that they've had long delays trying to get patients to theatre even once the decision to operate has been made. Um, so we have that data. We have asked sites to provide us time frame between decision made to operate and operation. We've not extracted it in this initial analysis, but it will be done for the larger paper. Um, in terms of getting to operations, so the, all the patients that had operations in the first instance, so the operative managed group, they all had their operations within 48 hours of presenting. And then of the ones where we switched tack and changed the management, 58% of those got their operations at day two and three. So it's not particularly delayed for us. Okay, good to hear. Um, another very useful point made actually by an anonymous attendee, he's busy that chap, um, that says that CT and colonoscopy will miss carcinoid and carcinoid of your appendix isn't that rare. Thoughts, Professor Moog? Um, well, the guidelines, the Jerusalem ones, I know I keep bouncing back to them, but they're saying somewhere, I think they say something like, uh, anyway, average at about 10%. I don't know, it's tricky. There's, I mean, there's other smaller groups talking about how they routinely plan an interval appendectomy. Um, in the older population, but feel free to define older. Um, and it's not that earlier, really, didn't you? Well, you know, I'm hedging it back now. <laughs> and specifically with regards to the paediatric population, Nigel. So the risk is, is much low, it's, it's less than 1%, and there's not really a huge concern about it. And so you wouldn't recommend an interval appendectomy in a paediatric population? Absolutely not. It doesn't make any sense at all to me. If you're going to take the appendix out, take it out the first time it comes along. Okay, that's a definite answer. Sean Appleton, God bless you. What would be the indications, and we'll put this to Professor Mugium, so would there be any indications for an interval appendicectomy? Ooh, I, I wonder whether partly it's surgical twitchiness. Mm -hmm. you know, you've got an older adult sitting there. Um, but then I also know that one of our patients that came in um, ended up getting a delayed appendectomy because the consultant wasn't sure that they were responding well enough or quick enough to conservative management and they were young and they worried about their fertility. So they got, you know, a kind of slightly delayed but early appendectomy because the, the consultant's beginning to get twitchy. Um, there's a question on there about, I think it's from Julie Cornish talking about how, whether the we're influencing patients, and I think what Nigel's saying is that parents are obviously influencing um, their decision and their kids, but I do wonder whether we do, because we are twitchy about the long-term recurrence, the long-term should we be operating, so I, I, it'd be interesting for the hearing to look at exactly if we've got more information now, how we, if we can we easily say you don't need an interval appendectomy. Absolutely, quite. There's tons of questions here. So there's lots along that theme of missed pathology if we leave the appendix in, so I think it feels like we're relaxed in the paediatric population and maybe less relaxed the traditional versus novel in the adult population. Um, Christian Makuchevich has said um, anecdotally they're feeling they're seeing a higher rate of complicated missed late appendicitis patients who stayed at home very long. Hannah did you see that in COVID harem in the data so far? So I don't think we've seen that in the data so far but it's not something we've looked at. We do have the data points there because we have asked what duration of symptoms that they had before presenting. So that will all be in our next analysis. Okay, so somebody called Sanjay, good question. So here we are, the polar opposites to Simon Patterson Brown, really. Um, thoughts about lap versus open surgery post COVID. So when all our aerosol worries have gone, we've seen these results. Nigel, what, what operation are you gonna do on a child with appendicitis if you do an operation? Oh, I think we'll go back to the, the ways of doing laparoscopy. I think we are, convinced of the of the benefits that I appreciate the data uh, to um, support that laparoscopy is better than open surgery in children is is less convincing but I think it's there and I think most um, surgeons now are convinced of that being relevant for children as well. Hannah having learned a historic operation like an open appendectomy, which one are you going to do next year? Um, I definitely think go back to lap um, they've got shorter length of stays and we've already got the evidence that it's a better operation for them from before COVID. And Susan? Yeah, agreed. There's some other work being done about um, aerosol generating with laparoscopy. If you've got COVID in the abdomen, is it coming, you know, is it going to be spread around? And I think if that research comes out and proves that that does not happen, then you'll get a completely different shift in the next viral pandemic. A game changer, wouldn't it, that information? Um, 
any data, again, one for Hannah, about what percentage of conservatively managed patients then crossed over to the surgery group and how soon did they cross over? Um, so it's 10% of the conservatively managed patients crossed over to the operative side and 58% of them, the decision was made at day two, but the range was between two and 29 days. Okay, that's useful. Thank you. We've got a lot of the theme emerging, a group of different, again, that anonymous guy's moving around. Um, female patients and infertility. What are your thoughts about leaving a messy pelvis in a female of reproductive years? Professor Moak. I don't know the answer to that because I don't know if we've ever... You're a professor. You're supposed to know the answer to everything. <laughs> I think I do. Um, but there's just, you know how like, um, research always looks at kind of general populations, the commonest one, the, pop, the popular one, and then you're kind of like three steps down the line and then finally we'll look at pregnancy and stuff like that. I don't think there's anything out there that you can make any sort of comments on. You're back down to surgical twitchiness again, aren't you? It depends how you feel and clinically how the patient looks in front of you. And so, you wouldn't feel that in a young child, Nigel, no concerns about subsequent fertility. Um, well, I, I, I agree with, with Susan. I, I'm just not sure we have the adequate data to really know, know how those children fare in the longer term in relation to their facility. But I, but I think, as some people have alluded to, that the issue for non-operative treatment is, is largely about case selection. Um, and I think the evidence, certainly in children, um, is, is really only there to support the more simple or uncomplicated cases. So I... I think just the short-term outcomes are probably more favourable with surgery in um, more complicated disease, let alone the long-term ones. Okay, yeah, that sounds so a very good question from a Mohammed Rabi, um, probably Hannah from the trial. What was the, was there anybody requiring a laparotomy who failed antibiotics? Um, yeah, in the failed antibiotics group, um, we had two right hemicolectomies and we had two planned and one unplanned admission to HDU and the rest all had appendectomies but we don't know the route yet whether that was midline or right yet or so. Okay and Nigel any laparotomies in your paediatric population? So we haven't analysed those data yet I'm afraid. We know that 25% didn't respond to antibiotics alone. We don't quite know what, what the reasons for that not failing was um, but we haven't looked at those data yet. Okay. Um, Maria Rodriguez has said that appendicitis in young children is complicated by free perforation and generalized peritonitis more, more than in an adult population. So she's, she's edgy about the conservative treatment because of that factor in children. Nigel, any pediatric surgery thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think this is about case selection um, and I would not be recommending conservative treatment for children who you felt had perforation and, and uh, generalized peritonitis. I think those children are best, best treated with an appendicectomy. A criticism of the study from Francis Golder to Professor Moog, um, given that this data is all non-randomised, it, isn't it self-selecting? The less unwell patients get selected for non-operative management and the more unwell ones get selected for surgery. So can this be used to help a future decision making? Oh, absolutely. Do you know I think that's the strength rather than the weakness? Because normally these patients um, are just immediately discounted for most of the studies. So yes, we may find when we analyse it all that they do split nicely into these groups, but I suspect they don't. Particularly if there's other groups like um, Edinburgh saying they just pretty much consistently persisted with lap appendicectomy. So you're going to get a lovely kind of maybe a bit of a crossover between what's actually happening. I guarantee it, but you know, uh, it certainly looks interesting. And sorry, lots and lots of, um, so um, Ma Munir Khan has asked, has the pandemic led to a shift towards doing a CT in the UK? Hannah? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and we've said yes in the paediatric population as well, haven't we? Um, so Mohammed Shams, quite rightly, going slowly towards, oh, somebody said new normal, we're going to have to shoot you now. Um, what, go towards a new normal, what is the panel's thoughts about managing pregnant women with appendicitis? So we'll leave you out of this, Nigel, because you're you. going to get this. Um, Professor Moog. Well, do we just need to force more about imaging? So more forward thinking about the MRI? I mean, for me, um, the, the big findings from both Nigel's study and Hannah's are that the management changed dramatically. And it changed and it's been shown to be safe at the moment with 30-day follow-up. So right decision until we get more information. 
and then pregnant women, should they just follow into the whole good thing coming out of this? It should be imaging all these patients before, unless it's like a really even barn door appendix in a young male. Why aren't we imaging these people? Absolutely. So get in Williams and um, with a thought to the trainees. Absolutely. So the elephant in the room is um, get said lots of the juniors have enjoyed COVID because they've done loads of open appendectomies an operation they've never seen or done before. Any feedback from trainees? Hannah, probably over to you anecdotally about the difference in the operations. Um, yeah, it's actually really interesting. So uh, an open appendectomy, I'd only ever done one on an adult and something like two on a child before COVID. And uh, certainly in our centre in the early days, we switched to all open if we're going to do them. Um, it's a nice operation, but I think I prefer a lap one if I'm honest. Um, there's too much fiddling around for me. I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> um, it's true, trainees, we want our operations and lap appendix is pretty much the only thing we're allowed to do independently for a year or two there. Um, so it would be a shame to lose that, but if it's better for the patient, it's better for the patient. Definitely. So I'm conscious of time. We're going to put the results of the poll up in a minute. We've just got a few more questions. I'm desperate to give everybody a shot. So um, Francis Goulder has asked, is there a different complication rate in either study between the patients who were treated surgically to start off with and those who were treated surgically after failed conservative treatment? Hannah, do you have those feelings? Um, so there weren't many complications in the failed operative group so uh, failed conservative management group so of the 26 um we said two had right hemis um one had a post-op wound infection one had an intra-abdominal collection that required another operation and as i said there was one planned and two unplanned admissions to hgu which probably encompassed the two right hemis i would imagine um so yeah there were complications in the 26 but not exceptional amounts. Another question to both studies really, so Nigel to you, in your conservatively treated group, IV antibiotics or oral antibiotics? Yeah, really good question. Um, and the, the, uh, we, we, we don't know the answer to this. Um, we're giving or we're recommending a minimum of 24 hours IV and then switching once every February. Okay, um, Hannah in our study? Um, we will be looking at this. So we have collected data uh, for everyone, whether they stayed in for five days full IVs or whether we discharged them on the day with a week of oral antibiotics. And hopefully we'll have something to say about that next time. OK, a comment about those who persisted with lap surgery. So I'm not sure if that's applicable to the panel. Um, Fazil Raghani has done suctioning the pneumo before delivering the appendix and removing all the ports. Did anyone else try that? I guess in the paediatric group, Nigel, did you do that? Yeah, we've tried that. Um... Again, whether it really makes a difference, who knows? Okay, um, probably Hannah, one for you from Sonia Lockwood. Any evidence that your CRP or your white cell count were an influence in the decision making? So we haven't got that for this interim analysis, but we've collected CRP, white counts, um, heart rate and temperature on admission and appendicitis severity scores. So hopefully in the big series, we'll be able to tell you a lot more about that. Right, I think we're probably going to draw it to a close there. That's most of the questions. So the theme seems to be about concerns about leaving um, patients too long, concerns about lap versus open, and concerns about missed pathology, and do we or don't we do an interval appendicectomy? But I think everybody's agreed that we should be imaging a whole lot more than we were normally, because you're right, a 20% negative rate in any procedure seems wrong nowadays so we're going to put up the um, results of the poll that was taken live so here we go now so um of the participants this evening um <laughs> about half of them have gone home for their tea now the number's gone down massively um so acute appendicitis most people it changed um with a drift towards the recommendations open surgery and conservative treatment and then post covid what would prevent you managing it conservatively? And as in the questions, concerns about complications and concerns about recurrence. So I know our study, COVID Harem, um, has much more data now. We're almost up to 15, no, 1,500 patients. Um, so hopefully we'll have some more meaningful answers and you can still join, you can still retrospectively enter your data. Nigel, are you still taking centres or have you finished? No, we are still taking centres up to the end of June. So if you'd like to get involved, please do. So both of those. Um, it just leaves me, I think, to say thank you to all our panellists for giving up your evening. 
Um, thank you to the ASGBI Secretariat, particularly Bav and Vicky, who's facilitated this, even with the jammy slides right at the beginning. Um, and thank you to the participants. That's a huge number and lots of active questioning. Um, I think that's us. And just to Mr. Guy, no, I won't be playing the piano. Thank you and good night.